All right, you can turn your Bible to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, expository study for Bible-believing Christians. If you're new to these, uh, the purpose of this is not uh, necessarily for all the doctrines and things, but more for instruction in righteousness. Uh, what can we as Christians today learn from the book of Revelation? Uh, most of the events that are described in Revelation are not going to be for the body of Christ. We're going to be leaving. Uh, that was last week, Revelation chapter 4. Uh, if you want to talk about the timing of things, Revelation chapter 4, John goes up, typifying the church going up before the Antichrist is unleashed. And this is what he sees in heaven, Revelation chapter 5. A lot of interesting things here. So let's begin. Revelation chapter 5 verse 1 says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. Again, you're going to see this thing over and over again of the number seven in the book of Revelation, the number of completion. It's the number most associated with God throughout the Bible. We'll see that in just a little bit. But this book is sealed within, uh, within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. Okay. Now I want you to see something interesting. If you have a King James Bible like this one here, there are actually seven lines on it. Here you have one at the top, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And this one is connected back to the one at the top. It goes the whole way around. Very interesting. These little raised hubs on it. There are seven on there. And I mean, I have Bibles that are very old and there's a lot of them have that. Not, not every King James Bible that's ever been printed has the seven seals, so to speak, on the outside of it. They don't all have that, but a lot of them do. Very interesting. And I got to thinking about it, and I thought, maybe is that the reason why the new Bible versions are coming out with a new, hip, trendy look? They want to abandon the old offensive, you know, black leather, gold gilt edge look, like that one. Got to make it look hip, modern, trendy. Just show you a couple of them here. Catholic Youth Bible, I always like to show that one. It's kind of funny, the New Revised Standard Version, it's a Catholic Bible. So, oh no, it's a Protestant Bible. No, it's a Catholic Bible. Um, how about these? Here we have Bible zines. Uh, these were, I had these in my Ridiculous Bible, per, Bible Perversions of the New Age video. Uh, how to Attract Godly Girls. Get out there. Awesome ways to make a difference. <laughs> cool, man. Becoming. Got to get rid of that seven sealed look, you know. You don't want this uh, old black offensive looking Bible here, you know. I just have to do it this way. I'll just lose my place, I guess, in it. But try not to close it and hold it with one hand. It's not working too good. Got to do it that way. See? That looks better to the lost world. You know, doesn't doesn't offend them as much. Or this one here, Explore. Uh huh. Or the uh, Gangster, Street Gangster Bible Zine. Making merchandise of people. Or motorcycles. How about this one here? This is a good one. That one. Right here, let me zoom in a little bit. Look at the uh, thing here. How about that one in a uh, Bible? Oh, they, they wouldn't do a thing like that, would they? Yes. Sparkly one for children. Kind of like a fishing lure to draw them in and hook them. You know, oh, I got to show this to this, this uh, children's one here. A lot of times I'll put really wicked stuff in children's things for children. Going global. Yeah. New World Order. Bible Zine. The, uh, what is this thing? International Children's Bible. They want the best for your children. Only the best. They're fine Christian people that put these things out. I'm sure. New Century Version. Uh, this is the Revolve 2009. 
other, you know, for sort of late teen girls. <laughs> you know, this one here doesn't work. You know, this King James Bible, if I can pick the thing up, this one doesn't work. You got to have that. Sure. How about the divine health? A lot of junk is what that stuff is. I'll tell you what. It's disgusting. But what's the deal? This book here, this King James Bible, is a unique book. All right. I'm going to have the Bible banner up for a while because it so illustrates the truth. This is the greatest book that's ever been written. Right here. If you have a King James Bible, you're holding it in your hands. Okay? Better than anything else. It's an amazing book. What you've seen if you stay with these studies. Lord will show you some pretty amazing stuff from this book. But let's continue. Verse 2, Revelation chapter 5. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth was able to, uh, or, yeah, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. You know, now some, of course, the scholars will say, well, it's talking not about the Bible itself. It's talking about some other kind of a book and whatever else. I don't agree with that. I believe that the book that's in the right hand of the Lord in heaven is the Bible. I don't know if it's going to be a King James Bible, but it will be the equivalent in whatever, probably Hebrew or something like that. All right? It's not going to be of the uh, whole new version line that comes from the Vatican. All right? That's what I believe. But what about this thing of nobody's able to open the book and to understand it and things? What about that? Well, let's check out some scriptures on that. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Very interesting here. The Bible says here, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. You're not able to understand this book when you're lost. Could say more on that here in a minute. Verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Again, so important to understand that. If you're saved, you are actually in Christ Jesus right now, sitting in heaven. One foot in heaven, you know, the, the old saying, you got, that guy's got one foot in the grave. Well, we have one foot in heaven. We're just waiting for the Lord to say, hey, come up hither. Up we go. We're going to be leaving. And so you say, what's this have to do with understanding the Bible? Well, think about it. We're connected to God in heaven. Who is able to open the book and loose the seals thereof? You're going to see here. As we go back to Revelation chapter 5, it's Jesus. Jesus is the only one that can open the book and help us to understand it. So if we're seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, then who is it that is able to understand this book? Christians. Why? Because we are in Christ Jesus. He is the only one that can open the book for you. And that's why I've seen people, I've seen men that have gotten PhDs, THDs, THMs, honorary doctorates, you know, all this other stuff, and it doesn't mean a thing. I mean, I've seen children that know more scripture than these, some of these big name PhD, you know, doctor so-and-sos and stuff like this. Why? What's the point? If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, if you are not uh, saved, if you're not born again, you can go to every seminary, religious college, university, institute, whatever you want to do, and it isn't going to mean anything. Until the Lord opens up your understanding and shows you what the Bible teaches, it's never going to make any sense. And I'll tell you right now, I've gotten more uh, enlightening truth from some of the most dumb, uneducated, hillbilly Christians 
than I've ever heard from PhD Christians. And I'm talking really, truly saved PhD Christians, ones that have gone through the university scam and whatever else. I'm talk I've heard things from housewives that are more profound than PhD Christians. I've heard things from farmers and mechanics and truck drivers and whatever else. I get these things, you know, some of you out there, you put stuff in the comments and I'm just like, wow, that's really phenomenal. Man, that's, that's deep. That's profound. Why? You have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I know somebody saw somebody in the comments, they're like, where does it say personal relationship? You can understand it, all right? If you're saved, if you're born again, you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, some people. But let's get back to the passage here, verse 7. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Well, um, I'd really like to do the good works that the Lord wants me to do, but I really don't know what they are. I have no idea what good works God expects of me. So what are you talking about? Well, the Bible, you know, is just a man-made book. Well, then you wouldn't know what God wants for you. But see, God loves you so much that He actually will save you, and then He gives you a book. Written instructions. The owner's manual, so to speak. See? So, when you're lost, somebody that's lost, they'll come to this book and they'll go, well, it looks like it contradicts, and it looks like this, is, this doesn't work out, and I don't understand that, and this is confusing, and... This is this seems to be immoral and this and blah 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 blah. You, know, you get all that stuff from the atheists, and uh, you know you won't understand it. And a lot of lost people look and they go, "Oh, the thee and the thou and the beholdeth and all this other stuff." I don't understand it. But boy, you get saved, and all of a sudden it's just like the Lord opens your eyes up, and you go, "Wow, that's exactly what I'm going through in my life right now. That's amazing. Wow." And you'll read through the same passage sometimes you know, for years and years and years, come back and it's like you see something brand new after many, many years. Why? Because you're sitting together in, you're seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is the one that can open this book. Nobody on earth can. When I say something and it, and you, and it bears witness with your spirit and you go, yeah, I was thinking the same thing. That's exactly what, it isn't because of my intellect. It's because of the Lord speaking through my mouth. And the Holy Spirit in you going, yeah, He's telling you the truth. The Bible talks over in John chapter 10 about the sheep don't hear that they won't listen to a hireling because they don't know His voice. They're like, Ugh, they'll flee from Him. And you know what? That's a tough thing to do because hirelings a lot of times will say a lot of good stuff. And they'll say a lot of things that, you know, you kind of, th and it's not even about itching ears type of deal. I mean, they'll tell you good doctrine sometimes. You know, I've seen that thing. I've struggled with this thing for years and years and years. You know, people say, who else do you recommend? And I'm like, well, brother so-and-so is good. And it's like the guy's a total stinking fake fraud. He comes out, does some kind of wicked thing. And I'm just like, oh, man, you know. You know, and I've had this thing happen where I'm listening to some guy and, and, I, and I just get this feeling like, Ooh, and I just come, oh, no, but he says he's a Christian. He uses the King James Bible. He's, you know, and I'll try to make an excuses for him. And a lot of times it's like the Holy Spirit was trying to tell me the truth right away. And I am telling the Holy Spirit, just, I got this one. <laughs> Not a good idea. But our text here is saying a lost person is not going to understand this book. It's a spiritual book. So, again, when you get into a debate with an atheist and they say, well, actually, over here it says such and such, and this says such and such, and whatever else, see, it's contradicting itself. If that atheist is not going to be able to admit that they're a sinner, you're wasting your time witnessing to them. The Bible says, speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of, of thy words. You can witness to an atheist and witness and witness and witness. With, as far, I should, shouldn't say witness. You can, you can debate with them over interpretations of Scripture. And, and I, I got in this thing the one time with this atheist, and he was going back to Isaiah, and he's like, see, these prophecies failed. This didn't happen when Jesus came the first time. And I'm like, these are like, you know, he's quoting prophecies that are for the end of the millennial kingdom or, or the second coming or something like that. And I'm like, you know, this stuff isn't, it, it's, it's 
prophesied for yet out in the future. Well, no, it should have happened the first time and it should have done, been this and that. And I'm going, what are you talking about? You know, what's the problem? Dead in trespasses and sins. He's not seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He's not born again. So the Lord's not going to show him anything. You have to be saved. You must be born again. No man in earth is able to teach you what this book says. I mean, let's, let's just get right down to it. There's nobody on earth that can teach you what this book says. Really, truly. You say, well, Brother Brian, aren't you? I am standing here speaking and the Holy Spirit's coming out of my mouth and not every single minute of every single thing I say, I mess up sometimes. Don't get me wrong, I'm not perfect. But the point is, a preacher will preach things that the Holy Spirit shows them and that it'll bear witness with the Holy Spirit in you. You know? That's why you get some people and they go, you know, uh, what's the deal on like dispensationalism or something? Well, when you hear about dispensationalism and you go, wow, it just fits all together and you go, that's it, that's, ex that's, wow, that's it, that's exciting. And you get somebody else in there like they hate dispensational teaching and they're preaching against it and it's wicked and it's terrible and it's horrible and everything else. Creation of the Illuminati or some kind of deal like this and you're going, huh? And people say, well, we, we'll just have to agree to disagree. I'm not going to do that. I am not going to do that. Somebody who's brand new saved that just heard about dispensational teaching for the very first time, um, and they, or, or they've, excuse me, I'll say it this way, they've never heard about it, um, I'll take it easy on them. You know, if they're like, oh, I don't, I, I don't know what to believe about this dispensational stuff. Well, okay, they haven't heard yet. But you get somebody that's heard about it, that's studied it, and had just, they hate it, they reject it, you're not dealing with somebody that's saved. I'm sorry. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 is crystal clear. It is a command in Scripture that we are to rightly divide the word of truth. It's a commandment for a New Testament Christian. So you get somebody and they say, I refuse to be dispensational. I will never be dispensational. They're lost. They're lost. It affects so many other things. I mean, you're going to be preaching a false gospel if you're non-dispensational. You're going to be having the body of Christ going into the time of Jacob's trouble. You're going, to, you're going to mess up the Bible terribly. The Holy Spirit's not guiding somebody like that. The Holy Spirit leads into all truth. I had to cover it. I want you to remember that to all you out there. Next, go to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, verse 45 through 48. Let's read that. And keep this in mind with what we read in Revelation chapter 5. It says here, Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. Okay? He doesn't say... Let's start out by saying, now you saw what's going on here, and, and you know the fact that it's written is good, but you know, he starts out saying, it's written. Thus it is written. Right? The Lord, the whole time that he's here on the earth, he's saying, it is written, it's written. You know, over and over and over again, he's referring to the book. You ought to think about that. You don't think long and hard about that. When you get somebody and they say, you know what, we're just going to have to agree to disagree on the Bible version issue. I mean, if you want to use a King James Bible and I want to use this New Revised Standard Version Catholic Youth Bible thing or, or the message or, or, you know, divine health or something, that's okay. We'll just agree to disagree. Oh, no, we won't. No, we won't. No, we absolutely will not. You get somebody that knows about the Bible version issue and they insist on these new versions, you are not dealing with a saved person. Just plain as day. The Holy Spirit, the thing that separates us from the lost world is we have a book. We have an authority. And the Holy, or the Lord Himself, we are seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He is the only one that's worthy to open this book and help us understand it. And so when you hear a man proclaiming things that are in line with God and what He wants for you, it's going to make sense. It's going to sink into your mind. You're going to go, oh, yeah, there, that's it. But you hear somebody else and it's just like, you know, it's kind of like hearing somebody taking their fingernails down across a chalkboard or hearing a, you know, whatever terrible thing. 
you know, squealing tires and car accidents or something like this, you go, oh, it's like you're repulsed by it. Uh, you know, I'll hear that with preachers. I'll turn on a certain preacher and, I'm, and just within about five minutes, I'm going, ugh, you know, like, ugh, what is this guy? There's a spirit attached to these false preachers. I'm going to tell you that. But let's go back to Revelation chapter 5. I also find it interesting that, you know, I mean, we clearly see from Scripture there that Jesus is the one that has to open your understanding. And when you're lost, you're dead in trespasses and sins. You know, you're, you're not able to understand, you know, written Scripture. And yet, what's the motivation behind a lot of these uh, things like this here, you know? These uh, Bible zines. You know, what's the motivation? They say, well, we need to make the Bible more attractive to the lost world. Wait a second. So what you're saying is you want to make Bibles that the lost world can read and understand? How is that possible? If Jesus Christ is the one that has to be there to open their eyes to Scripture and open their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures like we read there in Luke chapter 24, if it's Jesus Christ that has to do that, then how can you make a Bible that they understand as lost people? And yet, that's one of the biggest motivating factors. That's one of the biggest little uh, things, their little sayings that they do. The King James Bible, you're not going to witness, you're not going to be able to get lost people to be saved when they read the King James Bible. They won't understand it. We have to have Bibles that they understand, don't you know? We've got to have an understandable Bible for lost people. Think about that for a minute. If you have a Bible that lost people can understand, it's not the Word of God. I mean, the, the Bible version issue, the more I study it, the more I realize it's just, it's a lot more simple than most people make it. I mean, you can make it really complicated getting into different uh, unsealed cursive manuscript, or, uh, well, manuscript, uh, majuscule, minuscule, all this terminology with, you know, different text types and whatever else, junk. Boil it down to the simplest form, though. And the simplest form is, if it's God's book, it has to be perfect without error. And it has to be spiritual in nature. And God is the one that has to open it up. Your understanding of it for you to be able to get it. And if you're writing it uh, for the lost world to understand, then it can't be God's Word. I mean, if lost people can pick up a Bible and just go, Wow, I got this. This is easy. You say, well, did Jesus come down and open your understanding? Oh, no, 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 I don't need him. I don't need him to understand. I, I got it. This is easy to understand. <laughs> okay. Right. Sure. Revelation chapter 5, <clears throat> verses 5 and 6. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Back to that in a minute. The root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the, four, of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven head, horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. Hmm. Very interesting. So, we'll get say some more things here in a minute. But I find it very, very uh, unique and interesting that the flag of Jerusalem, this is the official flag of Jerusalem, and it's, you know, this word here is Jerusalem. This is the wall, western wall thing, the two olive branches. Another interesting thing there. I talked about this in my study on the two different flags of Israel. Yeah, the hexagram is the national flag. This is the flag of Jerusalem. But they have the line of the tribe of Judah symbolized right there. Weird, because the line of the tribe of Judah that phrase does not appear in the Old Testament. It appears in the New Testament as a reference to Jesus Christ. Why would they be flying a flag with a reference to Jesus Christ, a unique reference to Jesus Christ on it? How about that? Uh, probably because it's uh, his city. and It doesn't matter who tries to control it. Right now the Vatican has control over Jerusalem. Uh, they gave it to him in 1993. Israel gave it to the Vatican in 1993. 
and uh, <clears throat> the Vatican owns most of the land. I think it's like 40% of the land I, th I heard in uh, J Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem. So the Vatican owns a lot of the buildings there. But it uh, really doesn't matter who has it because you see it's promised to Jesus Christ. It's his property. So there's a bunch of squatters sitting on it right now. Uh, the Vatican and a bunch of unbelieving Jews who are going to believe in Jesus uh, at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. And they will be cheering the return of their king. But that's neither here nor there. But let's talk about this thing here of the, in verse 6, the seven spirits of God. If you saw some of the earlier studies, you already saw this, but I'm going to just kind of cover this one more time for people that are new to the studies. Isaiah chapter 11, if you can go back there to your Old Testament, we'll show you the uh, seven spirits of God, what they are. You can keep your hand there in Revelation chapter 5 if you want to. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding and the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. Okay, verse 2 has the Spirit of the Lord, that's one, uh, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, then you have two more, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. There's the seven spirits of God, All right? Uh, very interesting, you can do a lot of study into that whole thing. But um, <clears throat> here's where it gets interesting, back to Revelation chapter 5, verse 7. This is one of those head-scratching kind of deals here. Revelation chapter 5, verse 7. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Hmm. And you go, wait a second. God is sitting on the throne, but Jesus comes and takes the Bible out of his hand. You go, how on earth does that work? Well, here's something that you really have to understand and you have to always keep in mind. First, First Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Let's go there. I'll show you this. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. If I can get there. First Timothy 3, 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Um, great uh, is the mystery of godliness. I couldn't think if it was, was or is. Great is the mystery of godliness. Okay? Um, there's going to be aspects of the Lord you're not going to be able to explain in this life, in this world. You're not going to get it. And people say, well, because we can't understand it as mortal people, men and women, um, then I can't, I can't, uh, if you can't explain it to me, then I can't accept it. Um, so in other words, you would want to have a God that you can understand and explain and, and basically be on your level of intellect. Uh, no, I certainly don't want a God like that. I want a God that I can't explain. You say, well, how's that going to work, Brother Brian? I mean, he's seated on the throne, and yet he comes and he takes the book out of him that's sitting on the throne. How does that work? I have no idea. Kind of like the same thing as the angel of the Lord coming to Mary and saying, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of the Highest. Wait a second. If Jesus is in the womb, how does he come as the angel of the Lord to speak to her? Weird stuff. And, you, you know, what do you think of that? I don't know. I'm just going to believe it. I say, well, you're rather ignorant, aren't you? Well, I guess, yeah. Absolutely. When compared to the God of the universe, yeah, I am quite ignorant. I don't have a problem with that. Not a problem at all. Turn back to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah 55, verses 6 through 9. It says here, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. 
Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Amen to that. Verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So I can read something in the book of Revelation, and I just go, I don't understand that thing for one minute. How's that thing work out? I don't know. I'm seeing something there that I have no experience with here on the earth. But logically, it would be that way, wouldn't it? I mean, you know, God's not controlling the universe from some cabin 15 miles north of me here, and you can just kind of drive up there and check things out and whatever. No. Heaven is outside of what we understand here on this earth. This earth is corruptible. This earth is in time. Heaven is outside of time. It's eternal. It's not corruptible. We say, well, explain that to me. Explain to me something that never gets old or never decays or never goes bad. I can't really point to anything like that down here. You know, there's really not a whole lot. I mean, pretty much anything can be broken down in this world. Interesting. But let's go back to Revelation chapter 5. Some of this stuff, you know, there's not a whole lot of, of things in here. and I, But I will say, I kind of give a little bit of a hint here. Um, the Lord did kind of impress me with something early on in the book of Revelation chapter 5. Or the chapter. Yeah, well, I kind of did say book and chapter. <laughs> but it's like, you know, I looked at it and it was like, okay, this is going to take a lot of study to do this thing. And, um, you know, I just, not a good time right now. So I thought, well... I'll have to get back to doing that. So there will be some interesting stuff coming out about some of the things in Revelation chapter 5. But I wanted to do this expository study. I'll come out with more detailed stuff later on. Um, but there's going to be some of this in, the, in this book of Revelation. I'm just trying to go through and find challenges for us today as Christians. That's what my whole point of this is. But uh, let's continue. Verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. I thought that was kind of interesting, and I thought, you mean to tell me the Lord keeps the prayers of saints? Yeah. Does He keep all of them? Again, I have no idea. <laughs> There's a lot of this stuff. I just look at it and I go, okay, I, I have no idea what that's going to look like or what that's going to be like or whatever. Golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. You know, the Bible talks about back in the Old Testament when there were animal sacrifices, it was a sweet-smelling savor unto the Lord. You know, do you ever drive someplace and you're driving around in the summertime or whatever else, you know, some holiday weekend or something like that, and Fourth of July or whatever, people out in the backyard picnicking, and you drive past and, you, and there's some smoke coming across the road from their barbecue in the backyard, and it smells like grilled chicken or steak on the grill or something like that. You smell that meat smell, and it's just like... Oh, wow. Whew, that smells good. <laughs> well, that's the way the Lord was back in the Old Testament. He'd smell the animal sacrifices. It was a sweet-smelling savor unto the Lord. But uh, Romans chapter 12 says that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice unto God, holy and acceptable, you know, unto the Lord. It's our reasonable service, the Bible talks about. So part of that sacrificing is going to be your prayer life. And when you're praying and you're, you're offering up prayers of thanksgiving to the Lord, you're saying, Lord, thank you for this, and thank you so much that you saved me, and thank you for your word, and thank you. Just, just spend some time thanking Him. I mean, you know, tomorrow is Thanksgiving as I'm preaching this, and this is Wednesday when I'm preaching. Tomorrow, Thursday, will be Thanksgiving. But, you know, we really ought to have Thanksgiving all the time, every day. You know, the Bible talks about when we pray, we're to have thanksgiving in our prayers. We're to be thankful for what the Lord does. The Bible says, in everything give thanks. Also, again, very important. So, you know, the prayers of saints are important. When you're praying to the Lord and you're, and you're fervently praying the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, the Bible says, and when you're doing that, don't think the Lord's just saying, ah, what, that doesn't mean anything to me. Or you, you pour out your heart to the Lord and you just say, God, I just don't understand. I'm just 
having a hard time and I just please help me Lord and I just want to be uh, you know totally sanctified and cleansed and I just I'm so sick and tired of this world but I need your protection and just you know that means something to God and I think it's a sweet smelling savor to the Lord verse 9 and they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. All right. Uh, as we talked about in last week's study, the 24 elders, I believe 100% that they are two people from each of the 12 national boundaries that God established way back in the book of Deuteronomy and confirms it still for today in Acts chapter 17. And I found it really, really, really interesting. I'm going to actually put a little video clip in here. I wasn't really planning this, but just came to mind here um, that many, many, many countries are now building borders, big walls and stuff and gates and things on the borders of their country. I thought that was interesting. God's starting to separate the people. As the one world government is coming together, God's saying, no, 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 no. I mean, remember, this one world government that's coming, this new world order, the Antichrist kingdom and everything else, this whole thing is, you look and you go, oh, it's going to be terrible. It's going to be terrible because it's going to be a failure. <laughs> it's not going to be successful. That's why it's going to be so, so, much, so much blood and killing and everything else, because it's going to fall flat. It's going to be the worst, weakest kingdom ever. It's not going to be this ultra-powerful New World Order, Mark of the Beast, everything's just working great. I, I honestly believe, my belief in the whole thing is, I believe the Mark of the Beast system is going to last for three and a half years. I believe three and a half years into the seven-year time of Jacob's trouble, I think technology is going to break down. I think if there's going to be massive solar flares. It's going to fry the electrical grid in every country, and technology is going to be totally gone. That's why by the time you get to the Battle of Armageddon, they're coming in on horseback. <laughs> you know, there's horses, you know, people, horse, you know, fighters and things on horses and people, you know, whatever. Although the sun and the moon go dark and they're, they're gnawing their tongues for pain because of all the darkness and things. Couldn't they just turn on their lights? No, because I think the lights are going to be gone at the end of the, t uh, end of the time of Jacob's trouble. There's going to, going to be back to no electricity at all. So it's, this coming one world government is going to be extremely weak. Very, very, very weak. And that's why I believe part of the thing that's going to happen in these end times, and remember Revelation chapter 7 talks about there's a great multitude that gets saved, you know, which no man could number. So there's a huge number of people that are actually going to get saved in the time of Jacob's trouble. Why? Because it's not going to be any more faith. There will be a little tiny bit of faith there. The Lord can protect you and provide for you. But mostly it's going to be sight. You know, you get all these atheists, you know, prove to me that God exists. Oh, it's coming. <laughs> Just wait. It's coming. And it's going to be bad. It's going to be horrible. You know, I'm glad I'm not going to be here for it. But um, just very, very interesting. But I'm going to put up this little uh, video clip here real quickly showing uh, that so many countries now, I think it's like 70 countries, are actually putting up walls, building borders. Here we go. President-elect Donald Trump vowing during his campaign to build a wall between the United States and Mexico. The two countries have had portions of fencing and walls sort of in different spots along the border there for some time. More than 60 countries, mostly in Europe, now installing barriers at their borders to keep people out, mostly because of the refugee crisis that they have been experiencing. Whether you call it a wall or a fence, border barriers are booming, not just in the U.S. At the end of World War II, there were less than five border walls anywhere in the world. As late as 1989, when the Berlin Wall came down, there were about 15 border walls. Uh, today, there are almost 70. Greece, Hungary, Israel, Countries are building walls to keep immigrants and refugees out. 
What the walls are meant to do is to be a form of deterrence, to make it much harder to cross a border um, with the idea that that will discourage people from trying to cross. We have a lot better idea of what's coming across the border and we're a lot more likely to apprehend it. Along the southern border, agents rely on 350 miles of existing fence. We might only have 30 seconds to a minute before we lose sight of those people. The point of the fence is to slow down the traffic in areas where they're able to quickly move into the U.S. How about that? I thought that was pretty entertaining. All these people, oh, you're racist, you're this, you're that, because you, you talk about segregation and, and you know, whatever else, and, and uh, you're trying to split people up. We need to bring people together. Let's tear down the walls. It's funny, too, because Pope Francis said that, actually. He said, you know, we need to build bridges, not walls. <laughs> you know, it's like... Okay, how does that work out? When, you know, God determines the bounds of the habitation, he sets boundaries between people and says, you go that way, you go that way. Pope, the Pope, you know, God's man on earth, and he's saying, let's tear down the walls. Let's bring the people together. And God's saying, no, let's split them up. Choose this day who you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But uh, what about the thing of being redeemed to God by His blood? Acts chapter 20, verse 28. I actually went to the grocery store last night and had a Jehovah's Witness woman try to witness to me. And, and uh, that was fun. enjoyed uh, talking to her. And um, it's one of the verses I gave her. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Jesus Christ had God's blood. And I said to her, I said, you don't believe in Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, we do. And I said, no, you don't. You believe that Jesus Christ was just a man. No, we don't. I said, okay, all right, let me be more specific. You believe that he was Michael the archangel, came down, took on the form of a man, died on a torture stake, not on a cross, and then he went back up to be Michael the Archangel again. And she looked like, uh-oh, he knows more about this than the average person. <laughs> you know. And she's like, but we believe that Jesus, you know, he's my Savior and stuff. And I'm like, no, he's not. I said, you have to continually, continually do works and things to, to stay saved and whatever. Oh, no, we're not saved by works, you know. They're trained people. Jehovah's Witnesses are put through mind control. They're put through brainwashing. I felt bad for this woman. I mean, I really, truly, you know, tried to witness to her and tell her that you're not saved. You know, and, and it's just like, oh, well, we'll just have to agree to disagree. No, we won't. No, we won't. You're wrong. You're in a cult. You're going to hell when you die. And that's what I told her. Don't fall for the thing. And somebody said, well, I appreciate what you're saying. And we're just, you have your ways. I have my ways. No. You're wrong. You know, people are so programmed to be like, I can't dare say I'm right and you're wrong. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. If you're saved, you are right and they are wrong if they reject Jesus Christ. You know, and right there, Acts 20, 28 is one of the clearest scriptures that God, it was his blood that was shed. And I said to her, I said, if, it, if Jesus was just a, man, angel that became a man, and then he became an angel again, what could his blood have done to wash away sins? No answer to that one. His blood would be corruptible. He had God's blood running through his veins. He was God manifest in the flesh. Again, the importance of the King James Bible versus the New Versions. The New Versions take out 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifest in the flesh. They take out God and they replace it with he who appeared in the body, or he who was manifest in the flesh. They don't say God was manifest in the flesh. And it might be nice when you go to your little group there, your little Bible study Christian group at your university or your little local church or whatever else, but you get into battle, spiritual battle with a Jehovah's Witness, you have nothing that you can fight them with if you're using one of these. Look at verse 10 in Revelation chapter 5. It says here, And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. 
Again, who's this talking about? You say, well, these are people, these are Old Testament saints. Can't be Old Testament saints. Verse 9 says, they're redeemed to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. That's not Old Testament saints. Old Testament saints were Jews. Okay? And they weren't redeemed to God by the blood of Jesus Christ until Jesus died on the cross. They had to go down into Abraham's bosom and they had to wait there for the perfect sacrifice to happen. And then they were brought up. They were resurrected. It's sad because a lot of the Jews today are, they say, oh, you know, old, uh, you know, Grandpa Mordecai, he died and we buried him and, and uh, you know, we got to pray for him. He's down there kind of in limbo someplace down there in the heart of the earth, Sheol and stuff like this. And, and if we pray for Grandpa, you know, when the resurrection happens, you know, as long as he's pointed towards Jerusalem or something, you know, he'll come up. Uh, no, he won't. No, he won't. The resurrection already happened with Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. But, who's this uh, thing of reigning as kings and priests? Who's this talking about? There are a lot of places we could go to to prove this, but we'll just go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 through 13. I'll show you that again, this group in Revelation chapter 5 these 24 elders, they're Christians, New Testament Christians. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 says, It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Who is it talking about there in verse 10? Revelation 5.10, We shall reign on the earth. Who is it talking about? Christians, I'm going to be ruling and reigning on the earth someday with Jesus Christ. And you will be too if you're saved. If you suffer. I mean, isn't it wonderful? I mean, when you think about salvation, true Bible-believing Christianity is exactly reverse of what most organized religion is. Organized religion is you do so many works to make yourself better and better and better to eventually obtain salvation. You get put in the heavenly scales, you know, and if your good works outweigh your bad works, then you go to heaven or would kind of maybe go to, to go to purgatory for a little bit so you, you know, it goes down. Stupid, stupid. No, you come to Jesus Christ and you say, In my hands no price I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Rock of Ages is the old hymn there. I'm doing a little bit of the lyrics there. I'm a sinner. It's a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Paul says, of whom I am chief. So instead of you getting better and better and doing better and better and more and more works to eventually get saved, you come and you say, there's nothing in my hands. I am a sinner. I can never save myself. And you grab onto that cross and you say, God, please save me. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Isn't that wonderful? And then you get saved and you say, now i got to do all kinds of things and stuff like this and, and just live and I can't have anybody, anybody hate me. i just got to be the most wonderful person that everybody loves me and just so popular and whatever else. No. Live for the Lord. You're going to suffer. People are going to cast out your name as evil. They're going to mock you. They're going to make fun of you. They're going to put you down. You're going to lose your job. You're going to lose your health. You're going to, you're going to have hard times that you're going to go through. But it comes back as millennial reign. And by the way, let me just say a little note on this. Because a lot of Christians will say about suffering and suffering. You're going to suffer for the Lord. Oh, it's just going to be just a beat down your whole life down here on this earth. I'm going to tell you something. And I qualify now because I've been saved for a while. Genuinely saved. Since I was 25. That was... I'm 41 now, so you do the math. <laughs> I just can't figure it out right now. But my point is, what, 16 years ago, something like that? Um, here's the thing when you go through a really 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 bad time of suffering the older you get as a Christian there's, there's the basic training stuff when you're first saved the Lord will put you through some stuff but when you pass trial after trial after trial and you're still sticking with the Lord and you're still like you know what Lord I don't care like uh, one passage says though he slay me yet will I trust him if the Lord lets me get killed Hey, I'm going home. No matter what happens to me, no matter how bad things get, I know that the Lord's going to do something great with us. And when you do that, when you get into that mindset, you'll see 
right after a major boom, a time of just like oh, depression, anxiety, fear, just sickness, just some kind of horrible thing, you'll see the exact opposite. A time of such joy that you won't even, you just want to be doing cartwheels or something. I mean, you're going to be so happy, so excited. God will reward you here on this earth. I'm not saying your best life now. I don't think so. God will reward you though. The Bible says in Romans 8, 28, for we know, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. When you're living right for the Lord and you're, you're doing right and you're getting attacked for doing right, if you're suffering for doing right, if you're suffering for doing wrong, well, then it's on you. That's your problem. But when you're doing right and you're suffering and you're just like, I mean, you know, my wife and I talked about this just as a little sideline thing here. Um, we talked about segmented sleep. I had a video on segmented sleep a while back and, and the thing of you go to bed and then you get up for like an hour or two in the middle of the night and then you go back to bed again and it's like, there's some studies on it. It's interesting stuff. And, and, uh, we've tried different natural health remedies and we've tried all kinds of different things to get better sleep at night. And, and there are times it's just like all out of salt. We're just wide awake throughout the night. We can feel just evil and stuff like this, just attacking and we're praying and just, it's, it's, it gets rough sometimes. And I just, you know, we were, we've been talking about it lately and it's just like, you know what? There is no solution to us getting perfect nights of sleep from now on. It's just going to be like fighting all the time. Hey, we didn't get a good night of sleep. Okay, well, you know, let's see what we can get done. Hey, why don't you go take a nap or, you know, I got to lay down for just an hour or so, whatever else, and try to get to bed earlier. And, oh, another bad night of sleep. It's just fighting all the time, fighting in war all the time. But in the midst of it, in the midst of this suffering that we do as Christians, God will just flip it right around. He'll give you some of the most amazing blessings if you don't faint. Galatians chapter 6 says that, Brethren, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And everybody goes, well, that's heaven. It is heaven. You're laying up treasures in heaven. You will have millennial kingdom reign down here on the earth. But I can tell you right now as a Christian, you will have amazing times of blessing in this life. It will happen. I mean, you know, I'll say this yet. I'm kind of on a little bit of a tangent here. I'll get back to the study in a minute. And that is, I never thought I was going to get married. And I certainly never thought I was going to have a child. And I just said, you know what, Lord? Your word says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I'm just going to seek you, Lord. I'm going to fall in love with you. I'm going to fall in love with your word. And I'm just going to do whatever I can to get this word out there and get it, talk to people about the Bible and whatever I can do. I'm going to do my best to clean up my life and, and live for you, Lord. And whatever you want to do with me, fine. And I went through some really depressing times. I know a lot of you write me and you have some real depression that you go through. Really hard times. I can tell you, stick with it. Stay the course. Don't start thinking about, oh, Lord's forsaken me. I don't, did I really get saved? I don't, uh, you know, those thoughts will come at times, brethren, but just, if you're saved, just, uh, no, I'm saved. I know I'm saved. Because, you know, you start questioning yourself, you know, did I really get saved? Okay, what do you have to do to get saved? And then you look at it and you go, well, yeah, okay, I guess I am saved because I did ask the Lord to save me and I know that he did save me and uh, I'm just kind of down right now. I know. I know. I understand. <laughs> Stay with it. Stay with it. Why? Because, brethren, that's going to be you there in Revelation chapter 5 someday. Up there, safe with the Lord. Brother, sister, so-and-so there. Finally reunited, you know, and, and we're here. And we're, everybody's together. All the saved Christians down through the centuries. You get, I mean, can, can you imagine seeing Paul for the first time? I mean, Jesus, I always say about Jesus, that's going to be great. And that's the best thing of all to see, actually see our Savior for the first time face to face. I mean, wow. But what about Paul? What about Moses? What about all the characters in the Bible? I actually see him and walk up and it isn't going to be like, oh, you know, the Apostle Paul. Oh, you know, and stuff. It's just going to be like walking up and going, Paul. And he's going to be like, Brian. Yeah. 
yeah, I know you. You know, we know each other and stuff. And he's going to go, hey, it's nice to meet you. And I said, yeah, sure. Did enjoy reading about you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's going to be neat. It's going to be great. That's what we have to look forward to. So whatever you're going through down here on this earth, whatever bad times you're going through, keep in mind what we have coming. Keep those things in mind. And then after our reunion in heaven, we get to come back down to the earth and rule and reign with Christ for 1,000 years. 1,000 years. Think about that. Exciting times ahead, let me tell you. Verse 11. Revelation chapter 5, verse 11. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Hmm. Keep your hand right there. We're going to be back here in just a minute, but go over to Matthew chapter 22. I'm going to show you who these angels are. And as we continue, it'll make more sense too, but Matthew chapter 22, verse 29 and 30. Jesus is dealing with the Sadducees here in this passage, people that deny the resurrection. You know, kind of like your modern day liberal that says, we're not fundamentalists, we don't believe in, you know, miracles and things like this and whatever, the, the deity of Christ and the virgin birth and the blood atonement and whatever. We, we reject those things. That's what the Sadducees were. Very similar anyhow. But uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse 29 and 30 says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. We are compared to angels. In the resurrection we are as the angels of God in heaven. I do believe that saved people become angels. There are the 24 elders as a special chosen two from each of the 12 boundaries. That's what I believe. That's the only thing it can be. It can't be the 12 apostles and the 12 men, the heads of the tribes of the you know, children of Israel. You know, no, 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 because they're all Jews. It has to be 12, or excuse me, 24 from all the different tongues, people, nations, kindreds. That's who it has to be from. That's what the text says. So I believe God chooses two out of each of the 12 boundaries, and then the rest of us are appearing as angels. And again, I've done a big study on that. If you want to uh, listen to the um, study on angels, you can, uh, I think it's called Angels, What Are They? Type that in the search thing on my channel, and it'll take you to that study. I get into a lot more detail on the thing of angels in the Bible. But I want you to notice something. This is a good one. This is one you want to write down. Okay, for your Catholic friends. All right. What's the number of redeemed, saved people there appearing as angels in Revelation chapter 5, verse 11? The number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Okay. John didn't say the number of them was an infinite, you know, I can't understand it. Uh, it's, it's just way into the... You know, let me just show you here real quick. Revelation chapter 7. I'll show you this. Um, Revelation chapter 7 verse 9. After this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and people and things. But over here he says 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. He doesn't give an exact number, but he doesn't say it's a number which no man can, can figure out, it's a, which no man could number. He doesn't say that. He says 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. So I would say it's a number a little bit more than 100, or excuse me, 100 million. 10,000 times 10,000 is 100 million. And a couple thousand more than that. And thousands of thousands. Okay? Here's where it gets interesting. You see, how's this tie into Catholicism? Well, according to the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church right now has over 1 billion members. Well, if the rapture happens and they all go up and become angels, uh, how's that going to work? That's a problem. Why? There's only just over, you know, a little bit over 100 million. There's not even 200 million saved people up there. 
a hundred million plus a few thousand more. Oh, you know, the rapture is going to be so amazing. Tens of millions of people are going to leave. I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, it's going to be a lot less than people are thinking. A whole lot less. And it's not because I believe that only my followers are leaving or something like this. And, you know, uh, write, you know, call this 1-800 number here and I'll send you your official I'm going to be raptured card and the rest will be leaving. <laughs> a lot of people try to put that on me. That didn't sell. Um, there's, there are saved people out there and they don't all follow me. Okay. Um, I know that there are saved people out there, but it's a whole lot less than what people think. I mean, we're talking, you know, I'll say it this way, less than 200 million. Because if it was 200 million, I think it'd be, you know, uh, whatever, you know, uh, uh, 20,000 times 10,000 or something like that. Um, the point is it's less than 200 million people that are there as the angels. But there's another interesting thing. What if the redeemed, the saved angels there, us as we become angels in the resurrection, what if we're mixed in with the other angels that are currently up there? Now, again, I can't prove that. I can't be super dogmatic, but that would take the number way down, <laughs> you know? But let's just, let's just stick with this thing of it's, a uh, hundred million plus a couple thousand more. Um, what's that do for Catholicism? With over one billion members. It's a problem. And this is a hundred million, by the way, the whole way back to the first century. The whole way back to right, right after the crucifixion. Hmm. Very interesting. Revelation chapter 5, verse 12. And this is interesting too here. Okay. Again, think about the great, you know, this oh, a little bit over 100 million angels here. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Interesting. There are... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven things. Power. What's Jesus? He's worthy to receive power. What's the power? Well, he destroys the, destroys the Antichrist army, 200 million men, by himself with his word in Revelation chapter 19. Um, I think that you could call that power. A little bit. How about riches? Well, Heaven is made of gold and precious stones, essentially. And when Jesus Christ comes back down to the earth, he gets everything that's left. All the wealth of the earth. And he knows where there are hidden diamond mines and gold and stuff that hasn't been discovered yet. You know? How about wisdom? John 14, verse 6, Jesus calls himself the truth. He is the source of all truth in the universe. How about strength? Well, the Bible says that we are to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 20. We can be strong in the Lord, meaning what? The source of all strength comes from the Lord. How about honor? Well, the Bible says that every knee shall bow before the Lord, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Hmm. How about glory? Well, one day all the world is going to actually have to travel to Jerusalem to worship Jesus Christ, the King. And if they don't, they're not going to get any rain in their country. Zechariah 14, verses 16 through 17 talks about that. And what about blessing? Well, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3 talks about God blessing the physical descendants of Abraham, the Jewish people. And it's rather interesting because someday the Jewish people are going to have their headquarters, their capital city, Jerusalem, with the line of the tribe of Judah ruling and reigning from it. And it's going to be a blessing for the Lord. Let me show you. This is an interesting passage. Go back to Genesis chapter 12. Verse 1. 
Very interesting wording here. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Hmm. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Interesting. All the families of the earth are going to be blessed because of Abraham's descendants. And yet you get people today saying, we hate the Jewish people. We can't stand the Jews. That's the Jew world order and all this other stuff. The Jews are the synagogue of Satan and the Jews, the Jews, the Jews. They're supposed to be a blessing. I can tell you right now, I've been blessed by the nation of Israel. They're a blessing. I'm not saying that the government over there is wonderful and great and I agree with all their policies. I'm not saying that at all. But the Jewish people themselves, they've been a blessing to me. I'm holding a book right here in my hands that uh, it was all Jews that wrote it. Hmm. They're a blessing. And verse 2 says, And thou shalt be a blessing, the Jewish people. Hmm. So blessing belongs to the Lord. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive the seven things. And the, fa the final one is blessing. Interesting. Kind of a, a good reference to the second coming. He comes back with power. He gets the riches of the world. He teaches wisdom to the people and shows wisdom in his judgment, which is the strength of him being the king. And he gets honored as the king at the judgment of the nations in Matthew chapter 25. And then he's glorified in the millennial kingdom for a thousand years, people praising him and worshiping him. And the blessing that the Lord gets is the blessing that he gave to Abraham of physical descendants. And the physical descendants are going to be living there in Jerusalem with Jesus as their king. What an amazing book. But let's keep reading. Revelation chapter 5 verse 13. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I sing blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Huh. Now, I've read through that thing many, many, many times, and it's like, it never really occurred to me what I was reading, <laughs> you know? Again, the Lord didn't open up my understanding. The Lord will do that too, by the way. Sometimes you're, you're totally in the process of sanctification, you're doing your best, and you're, you're serving the Lord and whatever else, and the Lord just simply says, wait, I don't want to reveal that thing to you until you experience this stuff in your life or whatever else. Then I'm going to open up your understanding. That will happen as well. It isn't just, well, he didn't open up my understanding because I'm living in sin. No, no. Sometimes you're totally right with the Lord, totally in fellowship, and he just says, not yet. I have a little surprise for you later on. But as I read that verse, and I thought to myself, do you realize John is actually saying that when we get called up to be with the Lord and we're up there, clearly the body of Christ is in heaven in Revelation chapter 5. We're redeemed by the, the blood of Jesus Christ, out of every kindred, people, tongue, nation. We're going to reign on the earth with the Lord. The crowns are given to these 24 elders. It doesn't really say anything about the angels, but, you know, it's like they've been through the judgment seat of Christ. And we're there. And before the Antichrist is revealed, what happens? Well, our text there says that uh, every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them Heard I sing. Wouldn't it be something if the rapture happens and all of a sudden the people down here and they hear this roaring voice coming from heaven and it says, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Like that. And then they hear the four beasts say, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fall down before the throne. They worship him. 
Wouldn't that be weird? Rapture happens, everybody's going around, what's going on, what's going on, what's going on? And all of a sudden they hear, blessing and honor and glory and power. And it, it might not just be John, it could be the whole body of Christ. That'd make an impression on you, wouldn't it? You say, can you be dogmat dogmatic about it? Well, I don't know. But it says the whole world, all the creatures in the sea, on the land, everybody, they're all hearing John saying this before the Antichrist is re unleashed in Revelation chapter 6. Hmm. Very interesting. So that is going to be it for Revelation chapter 5, this study. Um, I have another thing I need to get done here and another one I'm working on. Uh, hopefully going to be coming out with these in the next couple of days. Uh, but uh, there's so much in the book of Revelation. Uh, it's just an amazing book. It's an amazing Bible. <laughs> you know, I mean, what, a, what, an, what an inheritance we have in the Word of God. But uh, I'm going to close now. And uh, we will see you in the next study. Uh, like I said, there's going to be a couple other ones coming out here before we do Revelation chapter 6. But uh, things are really starting to get interesting here in the book of Revelation. The um, Lord's been showing me some good stuff. So um, thank you for your prayers. And uh, we will see you in the next video.